101.1 FM KFUG Crescent City. I'll light the fire. You place the flowers in the vase. That you are listening to Counterculture Radio. I am your host, Dan Schultz. Today we have a gentleman, Gary Christensen. Welcome to the show, Gary. Well, thank you very much. Gary is the owner and writer of the popular and contrarian investment site, Deviant Investor. I identify with that, Gary. I've always called myself a social deviant in that uh, I I haven't watched television for 20 years and I I don't take drugs. So (laughs) I think it would be appropriate that I sign up for your Deviant Investor website. And you're also the author of the book, Survival Investing with Gold and Silver. And you're a retired accountant, yes? Yes. And my most recent book is Gold Value and Gold Prices from 1971 to 2021. Yeah, I've read this book. It's an interesting read. You know, I want to ask you, Gary, uh, a lot of people are talking about gold and silver right now, people who just see the patterns in the financial markets. And, you know, it got me to thinking about gold. Rhetorically, we we use terms like color something gold if it's really valuable and the gold standard and, you know, you go for the gold. And what's the history? I mean, why is gold so valuable? Let's start with the basics. Okay. um, Let's first of all state that I'm just offering a few opinions here. I'm not a historian or an expert on that, but uh, if you think back on it, gold has been used over you know three, four, five thousand years as a means of trading, um, as a means of communicating value. Um, Gold as an element is relatively heavy. It's got a specific gravity, you know, approaching twenty. It's uh, very much almost indestructible you know you have to use um, uh, certain types of acid to actually affect it most things do not affect it it doesn't tarnish you can hammer it down into a very thin sheet or very long wires it's quite um, uh, conductive not as good as silver of course but quite as it's quite conductive it's a good metal in many many respects and it's a lasting metal and it's of course uncommon I mean nobody values coal as a store of value but you value gold because there's very little gold and you know you talk about how much gold has been mined in the course of the history of the man and you come up with a relatively small number and if you um, you know, 160 million tons or something. I mean, and if you put all that into a um, a space, it's a relatively small space. I mean, I think I think I've heard numbers like a cube that's 22 or 23 meters on a side, 60 or 70 feet on a side. That's a cube of the entire amount of gold that's been mined since time began. And of course, there's people arguing about whether or not that's a real number or whether it's high or low. But um, uh, using that as a starting point, the important message is not the exact amount, but the important message is it's rare, it's valued because it's rare, and it is valued universally. I mean, a piece of gold is valuable whether you're in Vietnam or South America or Europe or the United States, and whether it's 1300 AD or 2000 BC or 2021 AD in the United States. It's been valuable for a long time. It's useful and um, it's appreciated worldwide. And I, I guess that's just part of the reason why gold is, is so important and so valuable. I guess as, as I uh, continue to try to, to deepen my knowledge of finances um, and some of the I, I don't know. His, I guess from historical terms, the craziness that's going out of there, out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's going on in the financial world right now, like derivatives or credit default swaps, or um, uh, for that matter, just <laughs> the U.S. dollar, is that you know gold is real and it, it has an intrinsic value, and and like you say, it, it's had this historical for thousands and thousands of years years had this value and it's not going to change and so you know especially as people are dizzied by trying to understand uh, abstract financial vehicles like derivatives which 
are up to, some people say, 1.4 quadrillion, some, you know, unfathomable amount. There's, there's this teetering of the economy. And I, I think something like gold and silver and precious metals, or for that matter, a shovel, um, has a certain appeal because at least it's real. Well, yes. And for instance, I have in my desk drawer a note, official currency from Zimbabwe of 10 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. Um, what's it worth? It's yeah. not even toilet paper. You know, the definition of hyperinflation is when your primary uh, unit is less valuable than a piece of toilet paper. Um, yeah. You know, that's a sub functional definition of hyperinflation. And when you print up currency like there's no tomorrow, like has been done in Zimbabwe and many, many other countries around the world. And, you know, I, I have to remind people that Argentina lopped eight zeros off of their currency over the past 30 years. And, you know, they're supposedly a modern um, country with um, a great deal of assets and wealth. And yet they've inflated their currency. We have, in effect, inflated our currency to the point of, of about 100 to 1 uh, since 1913. You know, gold was worth roughly 20 bucks then. It's worth, uh, in very round numbers, um, 100 times that now. Um, it, this is just a fact of, of the economic life that we have. And then, as you say, derivatives and other such um, more abstract, less real, less tangible products just accelerate and accentuate the separation of the average person from what is value and what is real money. And I prefer the feeling of a real gold coin in my hand versus uh, the possibility of a, a collateralized default obligation in my other hand hand that might or might not have value when uh, the counterparty risk issue comes up. I, I really get your point. And I, I think, it, it, like you mentioned, it has value to mention uh, Zimbabwe or Argentina or Weimar Germany when you know they were taking wheelbarrows of money and burning it because it was cheaper than, than other fuel um, because, it, because that happens. And, you know, uh, I, I read, I've read your stuff, Gary. You're, you're a good writer, and you talk about uh, in your book, uh, your latest book, uh, the normalcy bias. People think because in our lifetime, which is a tiny blip in financial history, and but in our lifetime, our experience is, you know, the dollar's king. You can spend it all over the world, and and we've always had this uh, essentially a life of luxury in the United States. And our tendency as human beings, with this normalcy bias, is that it that's it's always going to be like that. And that is exactly what normalcy bias does, but it isn't real. Um, yeah. It's real for a short term, but, you know, I'm old enough that, you know, and I uh, have to admit this, I remember a cup of coffee in a restaurant at 10 cents a cup, and you can't go to Starbucks now and get coffee for 10 cents. The important point is not whether or not coffee has gone up in price. The important point is things change and prices change. Our view of the world changes. I mean, who would believe some of the political things that are happening right now if you were going back to say 1950 or 1960? Who would believe um, the operations of, of government or who would believe the operations of computers if you go back 50 years? Um, things change. And we have to adapt to that. And if we presume, as unfortunately many people do, well, it's all going to be about the same in 10 years, then we're likely to be doing ourselves a serious disservice, both financially and personally and philosophically. Uh, so that's the point that I try to get to all the time is it isn't going to stay the same, but we can learn from the past and we can learn from the trends that we see in the past and then make reasonable extrapolations into the future. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess that's part why I like to read your stuff, Gary, is um, you, you have a tendency to, uh, as Benjamin Franklin did, to qualify your statements. I don't think I've ever seen you go out on a limb all the stuff I've read of yours, you don't make a uh, crazy speculation or um, you, you're, you're very careful with your words. And, uh, and I, I hold that in high esteem uh, because you speak accurately. Well, thank you very much. I try. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's as Benjamin Franklin wrote in his autobiography, it's, a, uh, it's something to strive for and it's a sign of integrity. 
So you also wrote in your book, uh, circling back to what gold is, J.P. Morgan testified in Congress in 1912, and he said that gold is money and everything else is credit. This really rings true these days. Seeing the value in, uh, well, you know what I'm seeing is, I'm seeing risk. I see risk everywhere. That What happened in Panama just this last week? Um, they've closed the banks, what, till October 1st, isn't it, Gary? I just read it on Zero Hedge, and um, you know we have things going on all over the country. We have, and we're going to get into this. You're, you've got excellent knowledge on what's going on in the world in world and silver, and I want to get into your latest article. There are things going on in the around the world, and even in our country, where they're setting us up for bail-ins. And if our listeners don't know exactly what a bail-in is, it's where the bank takes your money. And this isn't some crazy idea or a conspiracy theory. It is is something that happened in Cyprus, um, and uh, they have changed the laws and the regulations so that now the banks can do this in our country. And and this is, uh, again, normalcy bias. This is real. We have to actually think about these things, that it's possible that in some you know cyber attack they seem to be posturing for or a, just a big financial downturn, that the banks can take the money in your account. That's that has to be scary to some people, Gary. Do you ever have conversations about that? Well, some. Um, I'd like to back up just a tiny bit and make a point here for your listeners. Sure. Um, the money that is in your account is actually a misnomer when you're talking about bank accounts, because and this is is black letter law as well as case law. Um, the money that is in your account is a liability of the bank. It is the bank's money, and they owe it to you. It is not your money. And the distinction is important because when it comes down to it, um, you do not have an immediate and automatic access to that money uh, or a right to that money. It is a liability owed to you. The important point is if the bank goes belly up, then your account is a liability along with all the other liabilities and you may or may not get paid and you may or may not even be first on the line of getting paid. And <clears throat> this is something that, of course, it's irrelevant because all the banks are protected, protected by FDIC and it could never happen here. But Actually, it is relevant. Uh, perhaps it's not imminent, but it's certainly possible that bail-ins could occur. And by bail-ins, what that means is they take some of the money that's in your account, which is a liability of the bank, and simply access it in order to pay off other liabilities they have. And you might get paid some of that money back in the future, or you might get stock in the bank. Um, and you have to ask yourself, if the bank's in that much trouble, how much is the stock worth? You might get stock in the bank to replace the money they took out of your account. The bottom line out of all that is, if nothing happens bad, nothing happens bad. But if the bank gets in trouble, then you could be at serious risk with the amount of money that you have in those accounts that you believe is yours, but the bank believes is a liability of theirs. And this leads to the point that you brought up before, derivatives. The bank may be in perfectly good shape in terms of um, their operations, their mortgage loans, their real estate loans, whatever, whatever. But suppose they've made a bad bet on derivatives and the derivatives overwhelm to some extent, the rest of the balance sheet of the bank. And maybe it's through no fault of the, of the bank. Through Maybe the, the bank doesn't get paid by some other bank that is overwhelmed by derivatives. An example would be, suppose Deutsche Bank goes down because of, of derivatives. And the easiest thing for a derivative crash to occur would be for interest rates to rise. So then, as a speculation, and that's only this is only a speculation. Deutsche Bank is declared insolvent uh, because of derivatives and Deutsche the Bank then can't pay um, XYZ Bank here in the United States without naming names and um, then they bail in from your accounts and of course we hope none of this happens and we hope that these kinds of things don't occur but the fact is it can occur and it is possible it's the same thing with you know you hope that argentina dro doesn't drop off another three zeros off their money and you hope that uh, zimbabwe doesn't print up 10 trillion dollar notes and you hope that 599 other currencies throughout the world that have gone to zero value doesn't occur with any of the currencies we have right now but realistically 
you have to expect that those things are possible because they've happened in the past. And although they may not seem probable right now, today, September in 2014, they might be a great deal more probable in two or three years. So those are the things to think about. And those are the things leading back to the issue of gold, why gold is has no counterparty risk and is sitting there in your hand or a certified vault or whatever, it's still valuable. Those pieces of paper, those digital bank accounts may or may not retain their value or they may be seriously compromised due to no fault of your own or no fault of the financial institution that you're holding it with. Gold still has no counterparty risk. Nobody needs to worry about somebody paying somebody else in order for gold to have value. It right. simply has value. Anyway, that's pretty long-winded and I'll shut up there. <laughs> you're right. You're really spot on, Gary. And It is fascinating to me as I have learned more about this gold manipulation that goes on. You talk about this in detail in your book. It is extremely well documented. This, again, is not a uh, conjecture. It is a very well documented that essentially, well, essentially all the markets are rigged. But gold and silver, it is a, a, uh, a very interesting subject to a uh, story, really, on how and why that the precious metals are rigged. I mean, you go over this, GATA um, and uh, Ted Butler and... Uh, Dimitri Speck, uh, Paul, Craig, Paul Craig Roberts, and uh, David Kranzler wrote a, uh, and documented exactly how these markets are manipulated by our government, Wall Street, the banks, the Federal Reserve. The, um, there's, I mean, there is a legitimate conspiracy, isn't there? Well, yeah, I'm, I don't know if conspiracy is the right word, but certainly there's a collusion and a collaboration. And it, and, Sounds and, like a good definition of a conspiracy to me. Well, yes, okay. And and if I can interject there just a moment, really ask yourself, why would you think anything else? I mean, we don't want to believe these things are true, but really, why would you think anything else? The Federal Reserve's main product is putting out paper dollars and digital dollars. So they want to maintain the value in the paper dollars and the digital dollars. The federal government's main com main issue is confidence. We're, they're backing the, the U.S. dollar with nothing but the faith and credit of the United States. Well, that's that's all confidence. That's just nothing but confidence. So they have an incentive to make sure that we keep the dollar strong. And you know that comes to the petrodollar negotiations and the uh, the geopolitical issues that are we engage in. Um, so we have the Fed immensely powerful, wanting to protect the value of the dollar. We have the government wanting to protect the value of the dollar. We want um, the, the banking establishment makes all of their money not off gold, but off of paper dollars and digital dollars and the manipulation thereof, taking a piece of every transaction to the extent that they can. They want to maintain the value of that whole system. It's all in their best interest to keep it going the same way it's going. Now, if you take um, what Jim Grant said, you know, an immensely intelligent man who said that, in effect, the price of gold is the reciprocal of the confidence in the world's central banks and the world's fiat currencies. I'm paraphrasing yeah. here. So if you look at that, it's important for the banks and the governments to keep the price of gold low because otherwise it's a barometer. It's like the canary in the coal mine that tells you, oops, something's wrong here. Maybe the full faith and credit isn't as valuable as we thought. Maybe this is getting out of hand. Maybe the price of gold is going to rise. Oh my God, it did rise. $255 in 2001 and now it's up to 1900 We have a problem here. We must do something. Oh, we know how to do something because we manage the show. We make the rules. So yeah. why would we expect anything else? I mean, it's not, I don't think it's particularly valuable to go around screaming and ranting and raving that there's manipulation. I think it's valuable to say, why would you expect anything else? And then how are you going to protect yourself once you've acknowledged the reality of it? Well, it does seem to be pertinent in that at least some of the ways that they do this have been outright illegal. I believe that Naked Short Contracts are, are still illegal, yes? Uh, not in the commodity markets. Um, naked shorts are supposedly illegal in uh, in stocks and T-bonds, but uh, uh, that doesn't really happen. But uh, you can do a naked short in, um, in the silver market or the gold market, but it's supposedly for hedging purposes. And then you stretch the 
the term there a great deal, and you end up with the COMEX being largely controlled by paper issues, not by real gold and real silver, whereas the original tent, uh, intent of these futures markets was to create a market for the physical product, whether it's wheat or soybeans or copper or gold or silver, but now they've morphed into, at least in terms of gold and silver, largely paper markets that are controlled by paper issues where you can have, for instance, in 2013 in April, somebody dumps uh, I forget some ungodly amount of contracts on the COMEX at an a illiquid time in the middle of the night and crashes the market. Um, they weren't selling real gold, they were selling paper. And according to the way the rules are interpreted, that's still legal. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it shouldn't be, but that is still legal. But even if it isn't legal, who's going to prosecute? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're they're running the system, and and uh, it may be a, a little off topic. It might be a side note, but I I also find it intriguing. This whole business of either illegal or it's just plain old wrong that we've been storing other people's gold, other countries' gold, and we've leased it or sold it all. I I think there's 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 some shenanigans up there, and and maybe we don't, maybe nobody knows really what's going on, but. Uh, it certainly does smell fishy, and it, and it has to tell a larger story. Well, indeed, and you know we do have, for all practical purposes, zero transparency in that market. Um, the the the, the uh, Federal Reserve and the other um, other central banks do not report in the way that uh, we would like. Um, for instance, if a, if a Federal Reserve Bank um, or a central bank leases out gold, and the process by which that's done is they simply take their gold and hand it to a, um, a bullion bank, which is another investment firm. The bullion bank sells the gold into the open market. It's gone. I mean, it may be sitting in vaults in China now. In fact, it may be, have gone to Switzerland, have been melted down from 400 ounce good delivery bars into kilo bars that are favored in Asia. And then it's now gone and sitting in Asia. But officially, it is on the books as an asset of the central bank that sold it, as if it's still there in the vault, even though in fact it's not there. Or even though in fact we think it's not there, but we can't prove it because nobody does an audit. You know, for your re for your listeners, there hasn't been an audit that we know of uh, of any of the U.S. gold since the 50s, and um, that in itself is a little suspicious and causes you to wonder. But of course, the rule, the standard approach is to stonewall it and ignore the subject and say, um, well, you know, we got digital dollars here. Let's just use those. I, I really appreciate because some of these concepts are so abstract and some of the knowledge is so esoteric. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, as you did in just this, you sent me an article on silver, where we have to look at the dynamics and you have to understand these markets to, because there is no transparency, to say, well, uh, China is doing this, why would they do this? And we really have to use our powers of reason to come up with a picture of what's really going on, huh? Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, even then, we won't be sure, but we yes. can be reasonably confident in our speculations. You know, most of us are working our jobs and we're doing our thing and we don't have hours and hours of day to, to dedicate to understanding global financial markets. That's why having people that write on this, such as yourself and others, is, has such values. We can get an analysis and find out, okay, this is going on. And if it certainly interests you to invest or protect your wealth, I think a fundamental understanding of these things is vital. Agreed, agreed, agreed. And wealth is uh, very much a matter of um, where you have it and whose promise have you accepted that the wealth is actually there. Again, if the gold coin is in your hand, you know it's there. If you have T-bonds in a brokerage account and the brokerage account has hypothecated those T-bonds to pay off some other speculations like MF Global, then maybe your wealth really isn't there. But yeah. You know, in general it is, but really, in general, is that good enough? I played pool with a couple of buddies of mine in the neighborhood. We're right in the middle of playing pool, and my closest neighbor got a phone call. All of his money was gone. He lost $450,000. Yeah, I was flabbergasted that was possible, but I know in a very real way. It's never happened to me. He lost $450,000 in a snap of a finger. So it can definitely happen. It happened in MF, MF Global. And people who have, I mean, if they have a pulse and they're listening to what's going on, unless they're listening to the Mockingbird media, 
you got to be apprised of this stuff. You have to know this, you know, what you're calling and others are calling counterparty risk, um, that it's real. But hey, Gary, I want to get into the gist of your latest book here. And, uh, you know, you wrote that since it's clear gold prices are manipulated, how can I trust gold prices? And why buy in a rigged market? I think that that is the, the, the apropos question. Yes, we can agree that the whole game is rigged. And um, I, I want to hear your summary. I want to hear, uh, you know, what I think our listeners want to hear. Yeah, why would I buy gold if it's completely rigged? Well, okay, I have to object a little bit. Um, yes. <clears throat> I don't believe anything is completely rigged. Uh, well, I, I, let me say I don't believe the gold market, the silver market, the S&P, whatever, is completely rigged. I just think they're massaged and manipulated and managed. Yeah. But, um, you know, if I go to Las Vegas and I see the ball at the roulette wheel popping up on red 10 times in a row, I'm thinking, my goodness, that is a unusual because, as a matter of fact, the odds of that are approximately 1 in 1,000, 2 to the 10th power. Um, it's not uh, it's not likely. It doesn't mean that the r wheel is rigged. It just simply means that it was an unlikely occurrence, but you know, unlikely things do happen. Um, but what you can say is, when you look at this, is that if over the course of, say, 20 years, red showed up 60% of the time and black showed up 40% of the time, and they should be 50% and 50% or adjusting for the greens, you know, 49 point something and 49 point something, um, and you'd say, well, if it's showing up 60-40, clearly the, market, the roulette, roulette wheel is rigged. Well, it's the same thing with the markets. You can go out there and you can win in those markets. You can put your money on black and win. You can put your money on red and win. But if, in general, um, there's a significant slant, then you have to say there's some manipulation, there's some nudging, there's some management. Um, that's the, the situation that I think we're in. The S&P has been levitated. Um, it's... You know, that there, clearly the reason for that is that it works. People um, who are buying the votes and paying off politicians are the ones who are investing in the S&P. I mean, I'm drawing broad generalizations here, but the stock market in the majority uh, benefits the the upper echelons of society and less so the poor and the middle class. Um, the same thing with um, a lot of the issues in the market. So. We're, we have to face that, yes, everything is managed to some extent, but the reason why you want to invest in gold or silver or you know diamonds or land or whatever it is suits your fancy here is that you want some protection from the paper markets that, using the example of your friend who lost $450,000 in the snap of a finger, these things can occur. And paper markets are a great deal more vulnerable than most people give them credit for because, as we talked about in our malice bias, well, shucks, almost all the time they're good. In fact, I've made 12% in the last year on the S&P, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I trust the S&P. I believe in it. Whereas you gold bugs, it's gone down in the last three years. So why would I put my money in gold, especially when I know that gold is, is uh, manipulated? I believe that's the wrong perspective or, a, or an unhealthy perspective. I believe what you need to look at is to say – if something can go wrong, at some point it probably will. And the paper markets have a lot of risk in them and a lot of possibilities of something going wrong. And that doesn't mean they go wrong uh, next week or next month, or they even go wrong for you. Maybe they go wrong for your next door neighbor, but not you. Or maybe it takes another 10 years. Um, I personally think that we're closer to a larger event than that, but there's no way to prove that. But I think that what is important is you need to have some of your assets and something you can trust that isn't really dependent on those other issues, those counterparty uh, risk factors. And that means gold, silver, you know, or if you want real estate or apartment buildings or whatever it is that works for you that is more real and less and more tangible and less ephemeral. Um, if you really want to speculate, you know, go buy um, uh, derivatives and um, work with those things, but be very careful. Uh, so that's my point is with the issue of manipulation. 
Of course things are managed, of course things are manipulated to some extent, but that doesn't mean you can't be successful with it. And more importantly, you should be buying insurance, in my opinion. Um, on your house, you should be buying financial insurance via gold and silver or whatever it is that works for you. But don't put everything into uh, one place like um, T-bonds and the S&P. Yeah, and so in, in your book, you essentially what you did was analyze the factors and then you came up with a formula. It seems quite intelligent to do so and you, I think you did so fairly. You've taken into consideration the factors that affect gold. It seems very logical that because the, the gold prices are actually less or right about at, the price to produce it would mean that it would be very difficult to keep going down. Correct. And to the extent that it can keep going down, it's because the paper markets are driving it down and the paper yeah. markets are somewhat disconnected from the real market, the physical market. You can't be selling gold below the cost of production forever. You can sell gold below the cost of production for a month or a week or a year or whatever, perhaps depending on the circumstances, but you can't do it forever. And if the cost of production is continually going up, and on average it is, because a significant chunk of the cost of production is energy, and we know that energy prices are going up, you know, I mean, it, it, crude oil was 11 bucks 15 years ago, and now it's 90. The prices of energy are going up. The price of production of gold is going up. Um, unless we have a major reset, a major shift in the way the world works, those prices are going to continue to go up. My whole point with the model was, isn't there some way to quantify this? You know, I have a, a science background. I like to see things quantified. And I don't want somebody to say, oh, I really think it's going to go up because of this, or I really think it's going to go down because of that. I'd like to have something that quantifies it that has historical and statistical significance that I can point to and say, yeah, that makes sense. No, it's not absolute. No, it's not a guarantee, but it's sensible. It makes sense. So I took a lot of different variables, macroeconomic variables, you know, and yeah, it could be the T-bond the interest rate, it could be real interest rates, it could be the price of the Swiss franc, it could be the yen, it could be um, banana production in South America, you know, you, you, you name it. There's a lot of variables you could put in there. And then I, I tried to put them into a, a spreadsheet and I tried to start with this. Can I create a logical, rational reason why this variable should affect the price of gold, either inversely or directly? And if I couldn't, like, you know, salmon production in Alaska, I chucked the variable. You can't, if you can't come up with a reason why, then you don't use it. And then the second thing was, can I work a spreadsheet around and work a weighting factor in a formula that incorporates this variable and then make it help to reproduce the price of gold? And when I did that, after trying many, many, many combinations, I finally ended up with three basic variables that made sense intuitively and that connected with the price of gold. And then I just tweaked the formula to the point where, you know, you take this and you raise this to the power and you multiply by that, you divide by this and you come up with a factor and you say, this is a calculated price of gold. And then you say, okay, what am I going to compare it to? And the answer is, well, let's take the price of gold throughout history. Let's filter out using moving averages as much of the noise as you can. Let's look at long-term trends. And let's try to say, this is the long-term trend. This is the general price of gold. The actual market price may be a little higher or a little lower, but this is the general average price. Now let's see if we can reproduce that with my formula. And in fact, I did. And if you look at the book on what, page 25, I think, you see the formula, you see the calculated price of gold in one line and the actual smooth price of gold in another line. And then if you run that through Excel, you'll come up with a 0 0.9 a statistical correlation. In other words, the formula did a pretty good job of evaluating the price of gold from 1971 to 2013. Point and, nine is quite significant because one is a complete 100% correlation. So what was it? Point nine what? Point nine eight. Point nine eight is very accurate. That's very accurate. Now let's 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 qualify that with just a little bit. That doesn't mean that taking as an example, um, in 1985, my model said uh, the price of gold should be picking a number. Um, 350 and the actual price was more like 400 or more like more like 300 that is what i consider um a, 
just the, the variation that you're going to occur. In other words, it's not a trading model. It's a valuation model. What I want to know if I'm a long-term investor, and if I'm a short-term investor, I wouldn't use something like this. I'd use technical analysis and various other things. But as a long-term investor, I want to know, is gold fairly valued right now? Is it way undervalued or is it way overvalued? And the st specific examples of that are in August of 2011, when gold hit its peak at $1,923. The model said, and I consider this very important, the model said gold prices right now are too high by approximately 30%. In other words, all of you gold bugs that are out there screaming and ranting and raving that gold is going to the moon and uh, that you must buy gold right now, I think are taking a high risk bet, at least in the short term, because the model says it's overvalued. Similarly, if you go back to December of 2013, when the price of gold had fallen to about 1180 then you could say, well, golly, the price of gold, according to the model, is 26% undervalued. And if it's 26% undervalued, gee, that doesn't say that the price of gold can't go down another $10, but it certainly says that there shouldn't be a lot of room on the downside. And it certainly says that if I give it time, I should be in a good position to profit from that. And similarly, now I would say the price of gold is about 20% undervalued, roughly. And that tells me that, yes, it's a buy. It is something that you should be buying. Doesn't mean that it can't go down another $5 or $10 next week, such as happened in the last couple of weeks. But it does mean that overall, it's a good risk. And then you have to say, okay, so if gold is a good buy today, is it going to $10,000 in the next six months? And I'd have to say, well, not likely, you know, look at the numbers. Let's plug the numbers into the formula and let's see what we get. And the answer is not very likely at all unless we have some significant shocks to the system. But what you can say, and I believe I put this in my book, is that in approximately three years, and I interpret that as 2016 to 2018, then you've got a reasonable expectation for $2,400 to $2,900 gold. And uh, that's a reasonable expectation. There's no assurance of that. That's not a prediction that came out of my central, out of my crystal ball. That's simply a number that came out of the formula that's plausible. And that doesn't mean that that will be the exact price. That just means that that's a plausible valuation for gold. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the actual market price for gold during that period of time, you know, is significantly higher and significantly lower at one time or another during that period of time. But the value that we're working around at that point is something in the $2,000 to $3,000 range, not the $500 to $1,000 range. And to me, that's the important point. What's our baseline that we should be looking toward as a reasonable price? And I think the reasonable price in several years is is in that $2,500 range, the $2,000 to $3,000 range. And that means spikes up to 3,500 are certainly not out of the line. And that means that gold today at 1,240 looks like a pretty good buy. And that's my basic analysis. Yeah, I think it's an important point, Gary, that you delineate that this is not like short term. Today I went up $50 and this is, uh, well, what it is is long term pattern recognition, really. And you've, you've just quantified this into a formula which has a 0.98 correlation, uh, that's impressive to me because, it, because it's the way I think, actually. I, I've been trained, I've been playing chess since I was five, four years old, actually. And one of the most important skills in chess tactics is pattern recognition. And so it happens to be the way I think in general. I'm not very interested in the short-term little blips and hills and veils that happen in cycles. But when I see a pattern like, for instance, Homeland Security buying t 2 billion rounds of ammunition and all of these actions that our governments are taking, you start to see a pattern and you can assign values to those and come to conclusions about what's going on. And I, I think you've done the, the same thing here with gold prices. We've talked about what the meaning of that is. What were some of the factors? Let's go over what did have high correlation as well, an element in your formula. Let me just give the number one correlation, and that was the national debt of the United States. And the, the reason why I use that was because the national debt is a very good uh, proxy for the amount of money that's in circulation. 
if you have gobs of circul of dollars in circulation, then just thinking about it, if you have twice the population and a hundred times the money in circulation, it's pretty plausible that the price of gold is going to be 50, 60, 70, 80 times higher. Um, that isn't hard to see. All you're really saying is we put so much money in circulation that each dollar is worth a great deal less. And all you have to do is say, well, I used to buy coffee for 10 cents. Now I buy coffee for $1.80. Uh, clearly the money is worth 1 18th of what it used to be in terms of buying coffee 40 years ago. Okay, so what is it in terms of buying gold? a hundred years ago or 50 years ago it's all a matter of money of money in circulation as a first approximation and money in circulation an easy proxy for that's national debt and the one of the reasons I like that is because who in their right mind says oh I think the national debt's going to go way down because Congress is being responsible and we're going to control spending and so I figure the national debt's going to go down to 10 trillion from 17 right. trillion in the next few years nobody in their right mind is doing that and nobody in their right mind is thinking those things, or if they are, I haven't ever spoken to them. And so um, if you know what the national debt is doing, and you can see a correlation, and, and in the long run, meaning you take annual data, I think the correlation between the price of gold and the, and the national debt is something around 90%. It, in the long run, I mean, in, in any given month, it's not that tight. But if you look at annual numbers over, over 30, 40 years, you get a high correlation. That's because there's more money in circulation, there's more national debt, and consequently the value of each dollar is less, and consequently the value of gold, silver, diamonds, coffee, crude oil, you name it, is going up. Um, nobody buys a house for $10,000 anymore. Uh, nobody buys gold for $20. It's just that simple. So the number one variable I used was national debt. And I think it's a very effective variable for calculating the price of gold in the future because it has a good correlation on average. And secondly, everybody knows the national debt's going up. Everybody knows it's going up, and there's every incentive for it to actually accelerate its exponential rise. And that means that you have to look for the price of gold to go up exponentially also. Yeah, there's there's some basic math in, in there, isn't there? Yes. Um, I mean, they talked about this. This is not even new. I remember uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Do you remember those little cartoons they had back in the 70s? And they had the, one of the episodes was about Tyrannosaurus debt. We had a family business, and how does the government, you know, I had all these questions. The former comptroller goes around the country talking about how mathematically this stuff just can't happen, whether it's Social Security or Medicare or any of the other unfunded li liabilities. There's some mathematics that just leads us to the, the very sound conclusion that not only up, but as you said, exponentially our debt has to go up. And if you have exponentially increasing debt, then you inevitably have exponentially increasing money in circulation, the currency in circulation. And if you have that, then you're going to have exponentially increasing prices on average. That doesn't mean there can't be a three or four or five year lag, but then all of a sudden it catches up. And yeah. anybody who lived through the 60s knows, or the 70s I should say, knows how that works. It's going along and it's increasing 1%, 2%, then all of a sudden prices double or triple. And this happens irregularly and erratically, and it just takes normalcy bias and blows it all out of the water because you say, golly, now the new normal is prices increase 20% a year. And that's the key to um, scariness in terms of what am I going to do with my savings? What am I going to do with my 401k? What am I going to do with my retirement savings? Um, what do I put it in? And that's why in the 70s we watched gold go from $42 an ounce or $35 an ounce up to $800. People got scared and people wanted to have something that they could put it in that was safe. And so then bubble, gold and silver went into an absolute crazy bubble. And their valuations, I mean, the prices got sky high compared to real valuations. You know, the real value of gold should have been considerably less than it was at that time. But the market value just went sky high because it went to a bubble. And then, of course, it crashed like they always do. And I won't give away the rest of your variables. People can buy your book and uh, understand this in a, in a deeper way if it's their topic of interest. You also go into, Gary, these, well, your category in, in one chapter is possible concerns regarding future projections. The future will not precisely fit the past. Currency wars, so-called black swans. 
Talk about these variables in this prognostication model that you have. Okay, those are, are difficult because we're talking about the future. But yeah. you know what I'm really saying is the model says we can make reasonable projections. If we have three variables and the three variables aren't the price of gold because that's what we're trying to calculate, then the three variables are something else, national debt being one of them. You can pretty well predict what the national debt's going to be more or less. It's going up 9 point something percent. It actually went up 10 point something percent for a while. Um, and you can pretty well say that. You can also look at it and say, well, we've got never-ending wars, we've got baby boomers retiring, we've got uh, health care things that are going astronomical, we've got uh, uh, food stamps and all these other issues that are going out of line. Um, the deficit is seriously out of control. So we can say pretty solidly prices are going to go up. Similar with the other variables, you can say pretty solidly, well, I think this is going to go up a whole lot. I think that's going to do this a whole, you know, and so on. So then you project it out a few more years. And then you say, but what happens if this isn't more or less the same as it's been for the last 30 or 40 years? That's what I'm calling black swans. Suppose, as an example of many, many possible black swans, um, the dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world. That would seriously weaken the buying power of the dollar in the world markets, and that would seriously hurt um, the standard of living of a lot of Americans, and it would drive up the price of gold and silver substantially because the dollar would be worth that much less. That's one black swan. When is that going to happen? Who knows? What happens if we toss a small nuclear bomb into um, a major oil facility in Saudi Arabia? It probably would drive the price of crude way high, which would um, seriously impact our economies. Um, we'd have a lot of strain there. Um, nobody wants to pay ten dollars a gallon for gasoline, but you know you can consider such a thing as possible. Um, who knows what would happen in those kinds of consequences? But the things that you can be fairly sure of are the deficit's going to go up. There's going to be more borrowing. There's going to be more money in circulation. There's going to be more people trying to find some place to put their savings that will be protected, and the price of gold and silver will erratically go up, up, up. Um, another example that is my personal favorite um, that I never tire of talking about is a black swan would be Congress gets religion, says, oh, we can't do any more deficit spending. We're going to balance the budget, and in fact, we're going to try to pay it down over the next 20 years, and politics be damned. We won't worry about the fact that we'll all get unelected, and we will uh, throw the economy into a recession. We're going to do the right thing. Okay, now we all know that's not right. going to happen, but that's an example of what I'm calling a black swan. Okay, that's you know you can't you can't predict the future, but you can just make reasonable probabilities and reasonable projections. But there will be something that comes out of the unknown um, that throws the economy for a loop, and maybe it's another 2008 crash, which by the way a number of people predicted and anticipated, mathematically speaking. It could be any number of things that throw the the economy for a loop. I suspect that the model, since it's based on three simple variables, will handle those quite well, and simply the price of gold will spike higher or possibly lower than the model indicates for a period of time, and then come back to to more or less track on the model again. No way to know, of course, but you can just take a look at this and say these are reasonable predictions, and it's a reasonable approach to valuing gold. Yeah, precisely. And and in your uh, recent article here, I guess you just posted it today, the silver sentiment cycle. You have a uh, a list of of the variables. So yeah, I, I like this because it's in a nice little list format. The factors that are favorable for silver prices are on the left. More debt and more war. That's favorable for buying precious metals. Congressional corruption. <laughs> I, I, I laugh because it's so painful. Of, of, uh, it just doesn't seem that it's going away anytime soon. A weaker dollar, uh, higher gasoline. I mean, all of the factors that seem favorable for pre precious metals. Uh, as I said before, anybody with a pulse who knows what's going on in the world all of the factors are favorable. The you know the so-called um, uh, intangibles or black swans or things that we can't predict. All of those factors are in favor of of precious metals. So it it makes perfect sense. It's also 
uh, encouraging that your model actually handles those factors as well. Well, and it, that is, that's what I was saying. I believe the model is robust. And by that, I mean, yeah. you've got a model that says, this is what it, th what it's going to do. And we had shock and awe. We had market crashes. We had T-bond crashes. We had NASDAQ crashes. We had um, uh, euphoria. We had peace in our time. We had the Berlin Wall coming down. We had all these different things. And the model was simple enough and basic enough that it just incorporated all those things and didn't worry about it. And that's yeah. the that's the reason why I say it has a reasonable chance of managing um, all the craziness that's likely to occur in our fairly near future. Last couple questions here, Gary. What do you see? I mean, I, I like people who take a step out on a limb and, and make predictions, no matter how solid their their model is. Just because we want to see the future and we want to, you know, know what to expect, we want to prepare ourselves. Where do you see this going eventually? I've seen numbers as far as ten thousand dollars for an ounce of gold. Well, ten thousand dollars for an ounce of gold sounds absolutely crazy to today's standards, but um, and, 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 and frankly, I don't consider that really out of line. Uh, Mr. Gold, Jim Sinclair, has, made, has gone on record saying that's quite possible. Uh, J James Rickards, who's written the book The Death of Money, um, and he's clearly an insider and a very smart man, um, has done the mathematics and his way of looking at it and says, and says seven to $10,000 is a perfectly reasonable reset for the price of gold, given the circumstances of our massive debt and the other issues in our financial situation. Now, he's not saying life is going to be pretty if we have $10,000 gold, but it, let's let's look at the world as it is, not the way we want it to be. Um, I don't see $10,000 gold as insane. And in fact, one of my chapters is $10,000 gold, what would it take? And so what I did was I just took the formula, took the model, plugged in numbers projecting forward to roughly 2021, and said, well, let's look at this and say that's possible, and this seems reasonable, and this is very reasonable based on the past. Plug it in the model, and bang, out comes the number. And then you say, okay, and we can have spikes higher and spikes lower. And at that point, I say, yeah, $10,000 is possible. It may not be probable, but it's certainly possible. And you know, $5,000 a gold looks very, very probable in the year 2021, unless we have some kind of major deflationary collapse and, um, and we're living in a, a state that nobody wants to live in. Then a, high, a much higher price of gold seems just very, very likely. Um, and I'm in good company by picking five to $10,000 gold because there's a lot of other highly competent, highly intelligent people that have projected similar numbers. And so I put the numbers in the, in the book and, and put it right out there. Um, that's not a prediction. There's no, um, nothing in my book that says this has to happen. I'm not predicting this happen. I'm simply saying the mathematics and the model supports this as a reasonable projection. Yeah, I understand the distinction, and it's uh, it's a fair one. So, you know, on this show, Gary, mostly, lately we've been talking a lot about economics, but the show is based on sustainability, and we also outline unsustainable practices, which is why you're here and we're having this conversation. To wrap this up in the context of our show, is our system, from your perspective and your model and your scientific mathematical background, would you call this system unsustainable, this financial system? Well, yes, um, and, the, and the reason I hesitate, the main caveat is that you look at a system like this, you do the mathematics, and you say, well, this can't last. The problem is that um, you can say that in 2002 and 2004 and 2007 and 2009, and it's still here. It's just been yeah. tweaked and it's just been managed. So the, the problem is, that, in my mind, is that when you say, well, it's, it can't last, people think, oh, my God, it's going to collapse tomorrow. Well, no, it's probably not going to collapse tomorrow. I mean, it might, but um, chances are very good that it's been here for a long time. I mean, Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. The system has adapted. People have adapted. Um, overall, um, you'd have to say maybe it isn't a 
good, but there's a lot of changes and people adapted. I mean, people survived World War One. people survived World War Two. people will survive the financial catastrophes that are likely to occur in the next five to ten years. It, is it unsustainable? Is it sustainable in its current status? No, I don't think so. Um, is it going to continue for a while longer? Almost certainly. Um, is it going to continue for five years? I don't know. Is it going to continue for ten? Seems unlikely, um, but who knows? You know, that's the that's the problem, and that's why I has I hedge on this whole thing. Is it doesn't seem yeah. likely it's going to last, but it's very very hard to predict when. Fair enough. Why well, I told you at the beginning why I like your uh, writing is that you qualify your statements and speak accurately. So, Gary, um, if people want to find your stuff, how do they find you? Well, okay, my writing, um, and I publish an article or two a week, is on deviantinvestor.com, just deviantinvestor, all one word, dot com. Um, I'm out there quite a bit. Um, my book is available. Um, you can find the links on Deviant Investor. You can go to Amazon. Everything's available on Amazon. And gold value and gold prices, we'll search on that and you'll find it, or just search on Gary Christensen, you'll find find it. Um, it's available on my own website, gechristensen.com. That's how to find the book. That's how to, that's how to go read it. Um, it's not going to appeal to a whole lot of people because people don't want to look at it. But the ones that are seriously interested in their investments, seriously interested in the markets, um, don't necessarily believe what CNBC is putting out all the time, want to look at how to preserve their wealth. Um, the book probably can speak to them and probably has something valuable to say to them. Gary, thanks for being on the show and sharing your knowledge and your writings about uh, gold and economics and, and what it all means to us. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Today.